This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 115. Coming up on Space Time. Discovery of two interstellar objects which reach the Earth. NASA's new time-lapse movie of the universe. And SpaceX's new record-breaking launch. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have confirmed that two meteors which burnt up in Earth's atmosphere were both alien visitors from interstellar space. When we think of interstellar visitors passing through our solar system, astronomers usually think of Oumuamua and 21i Borisev. Both were identified by their speed and unusual parabolic trajectories as they swept around the Sun and through our neighbourhood. And both weren't detected until they were already on their way out back towards interstellar space. However, it now turns out they weren't the first interstellar visitors identified. Scientists have now confirmed that a small meteor called Senios 140108, first reported on the pre-press physics website archive.org in 2019 by astronomers Abraham Loeb and Amir Siraj from Harvard University, was also an interstellar object. The half-metre-wide meteor was actually detected by US government military sensors on January the 8th, 2014, hitting the Earth's atmosphere near Manus Island off the northeast coast of Papua New Guinea. However, it was only in April this year that the United States Space Command released previously classified details of the meteor, including its speed and precise direction of travel. And that allowed Loeb and Siraj to confirm their earlier suspicions. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, means the meteor predated the interstellar object of Maumau by 3.8 years and the interstellar object Tuai Borisev by 5.6 years. Sinios 2014-0108, which is now also known as Sinios 1, 2014-0108, also known as Interstellar Meteor 1 or IM1, is estimated to have a mass of around 460 kilograms and was some 0.45 metres wide. It entered Earth's atmosphere at a pre-impact velocity of 60 kilometres per second. IM1 was detected by the light the meteor emitted as it burnt up in Earth's atmosphere. Now, based on these details, Loeb and Siraj say the meteor originated from an unbound hyperbolic orbit with a confidence of 99.999%. And the measured peak in the apparent light curve at an altitude of 18.7 kilometres implies ambient ram pressure of 194 megapascals when the meteor disintegrated. Now, that level of material strength is more than 20 times higher than the average stony meteorite found on Earth, and it's twice as strong as the best iron meteorites. It was also dynamically unusual in that its speed relative to the local standard of rest is shared by less than 5% of all stars. As a result of those findings, last month Loeb announced the Galileo Project expedition, which will have the daunting task of searching for fragments of the meteor on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. A mammoth job. But if they find bits of it, the rewards will be out of this world. And it turns out IM1 wasn't alone. On March 9, 2017, Interstellar Meteor CNOS 2017-0309 or Interstellar Meteor 2 or IM2 slammed into the Earth's atmosphere over the Atlantic Ocean just near Portugal. This time the meteor was detected in data from NASA's Centre for Near-Earth Object Studies or CENIOS Fireball Catalogue. It also burnt up in Earth's atmosphere. It was detected at an altitude of 23 kilometres, was roughly a metre wide and was travelling at 40 kilometres per second. And it was massive, estimated to be roughly 6.3 tonnes. Now, similar to IM-1, it too had high mechanical strength. Loeb and Siraj say IM-1 and 2 are ranked first and third in terms of material strength out of all 273 fireballs in the Senios catalogue, suggesting they're composed of refractory elements. This implies they both originated from a population with material strength characteristically higher than meteors originating from within our solar system. Refractory metals are a class of elements that are extraordinarily resistant to heat and wear. 
The authors say both appear to be representative of a background population on random trajectories and their combined detections implies that approximately 40% of all refractory elements are locked in meter-scale interstellar objects. And that also suggests that these things didn't originate from a planetary system. Loeb and Siraj propose that IM-1 and 2 could both be iron-rich bullets, quite literally debris from dead stars fired out in supernova explosions, which would make them fascinating targets to find. This is space-time. Still to come, NASA's new time-lapse movie of the universe and SpaceX's record-breaking launch. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Neowise spacecraft has provided astronomers with a new time-lapse movie of the universe showing how it's evolved over the past decade. Every six months, the Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or Neowise spacecraft, completes one trip halfway around the Sun, taking images in all directions. Now stitched together, these images form an all-sky map, showing the locations and brightness of quite literally hundreds of millions of objects. Using 18 all-sky maps produced by the spacecraft, with maps 19 and 20 to be released in March next year, scientists have created what is essentially a time-lapse movie of the sky, revealing changes across the universe over the past decade. Each map is a tremendous resource for astronomers. But when viewed in sequence as a time-lapse movie, they serve as an even stronger resource for trying to better understand the universe and its evolution. Comparing the maps can reveal distant objects that have changed position or brightened over time, what's known as time-domain astronomy. Neowise principal investigator Amy Meinzer from the University of Arizona, Tucson, says if you go outside and look at the night sky, it might seem like nothing ever changes. But in reality, that's certainly not the case. There are stars flaring and exploding, asteroids whizzing by, black holes tearing stars apart. In fact, Meinstner says the universe is really a very busy active place. Neowise was originally a data processing project designed to retrieve asteroid detections and characteristics from WISE, an observatory launched in 2009 and tasked with scanning the entire sky to find and study objects outside our solar system. The spacecraft used cryogenically cooled detectors that made them sensitive to infrared. Not visible to the human eye, infrared light is radiated by a plethora of cosmic objects, including small nearby stars, some of the most luminous galaxies in the universe, and dead stars called brown dwarves. The WISE mission ended in 2011 after the onboard coolant needed for some of the infrared observations finally ran out but the spacecraft and some of its other infrared detectors were still functional. So in 2013, NASA repurposed the spacecraft and used it to track asteroids and other near-Earth objects, or NEOs. Both the mission and the spacecraft received a new name accordingly, NEOWISE. Despite the change, the infrared telescope has continued to scan the sky every six months, and astronomers have continued to use the data to study objects outside our solar system. For example, in 2020, scientists released the second iteration of a project called CatWise, a catalogue of objects from 12 Neowise all-sky maps. Researchers used the catalogue to study brown dwarves, a population of failed stars found throughout the galaxy and also lurking in the darkness close to our own solar system. Though they form like stars, brown dwarves don't have enough mass to trigger the nuclear fusion process which causes stars like our sun to shine. Instead, they radiate their heat through gravitational contraction, the same process used by large planets such as Jupiter. Because of their proximity to Earth, nearby brown dwarves appear to move faster across the sky compared to more distant stars moving at the same speed. So, one way to identify brown dwarves amongst millions of objects in the catalogue is to look for objects that move. A complementary project to CatWise called Backyard Worlds Planet 9 invites citizen scientists to sift through Neowise data for moving objects that computer searches could have missed. With the original two Wise All Sky maps, scientists found some 200 brown dwarves within 65 light years of the Earth. That's literally on our back door. 
and the additional Neowise maps have so far revealed another 60, and they've also doubled the number of the coldest brown dwarfs seen. Now, compared to warmer brown dwarfs, these colder ones may have a stranger story to tell in terms of how they formed and when. These discoveries are helping to illuminate the menagerie of strange objects in our solar neighbourhood. And a more complete count of brown dwarfs close to the sun tells scientists how efficient star formation is in our galaxy and how early it began. Watching the sky change over more than a decade has also contributed to studies of how stars form. Neowires can also appear into dusty blankets hiding protostars or balls of hot gas that are well on their way to becoming stars. Over the course of years, protostars flicker and flare as they accumulate more and more mass from the dust clouds that surround them. Scientists are now conducting long-term monitoring of almost a thousand protostars with NEOIs to gain insights into the early stages of star formation. This report from NASA TV. New time-lapse movies from NASA's NEOWISE mission give astronomers the opportunity to observe objects like stars and black holes as they move and change over time. The videos were made by combining more than 10 years of observations. We have ignition and liftoff of a... When the mission launched, it was called WISE, and its goal was to study the universe outside our solar system. But NASA repurposed the mission. Now under the name NEOWISE, its main job is to actually find and track asteroids, comets, and other near-Earth objects. To do that, it continuously takes pictures, just like scanning the inside of a globe, to complete one all-sky image every six months. By combining 18 all-sky images taken over more than a decade, the mission is opening up a deeper understanding of the universe. Like feeding black hole, as gas is pulled in close to the black hole, it gets hotter and brighter, indicating the black hole may have eaten a star. A star reaching the end of its life. As it runs out of fuel, it appears to pulse as it expands and contracts. Round dwarfs are objects that form like stars, but aren't massive enough to become stars. Using WISE and NEOWISE data, scientists have identified hundreds of brown dwarfs hiding in our cosmic neighborhood. And more discoveries outside our solar system are expected. There are many more treasures yet to be found in the NEOWISE all-sky maps. This is Space Time. Still to come, SpaceX's new record-breaking launch, an Atlas V launches two new satellites into orbit, and later in the science report, a new variant of COVID-19, Omicron BA 2.75.2, which largely evades neutralizing antibodies and treatments. All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX is continuing to set new records with an unprecedented 53 launches in 53 weeks. The latest launch involved the first satellite to be built under ESA's Eurostar NEO program, the UTELSAT Hotbird 13F, which blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida during the early hours of October the 15th. Built by Airbus Defence and Space on a Eurostar Neo telecommunications satellite platform, Hotbird 13F will be joined in geostationary orbit next month by its sister satellite 13G. The twin 4,500kg spacecraft each carry enough fuel for a 15-year lifespan and will broadcast more than 1,000 TV channels into homes across Europe, Northern Africa and the Middle East, replacing three older satellites. Each spacecraft is equipped with L-band and 80 KU band transponders. After the launch, the Falcon 9's fairing halves splashed down and were retrieved 781 kilometers downrange, while the core stage, which was on its third flight, landed safely on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, which had been pre-positioned 633 kilometers downrange from Cape Canaveral. Just days earlier, SpaceX launched Intelsat's Galaxy 33 and 34 communication satellites aboard another Falcon 9 rocket, also from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. 
That Falcon 9 booster also returned to Earth safely, landing on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas nine minutes after launch. It was the 14th launch and landing for the same Falcon 9 booster. The flight had been delayed two days to allow additional time for payload vehicle checkouts after the initial launch was scrubbed due to a small helium leak. And that launch came just days after a Falcon 9 doubleheader with a launch of 52 Starlink satellites in the evening and NASA's Crew-5 mission carrying four new astronauts to the International Space Station in the afternoon. The Falcon 9 first stage rockets used on both launches landed successfully on the drone ships just read the instructions and a shortfall of gravitas downrange in the Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket has carried two new telecommunications satellites into geostationary orbit. The mission from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida carried the SES-20 and 21 satellites for a Luxembourg telecommunications company. The 60-metre-tall Atlas V was equipped with three strap-on solid rocket boosters and a Centaur upper stage for the mission. The twin 3,500kg spacecraft were built by Boeing Satellite Systems using their 702 platform equipped with C-band communication systems. The flight was one of the last for the Atlas launch vehicle, which will be replaced later next year by the new Vulcan Centaur launch system. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.